Hi, I'm Candy Purdom from Anderson's Bookshop. It's my pleasure today to welcome our special guest, New York Times bestselling author Tom Parada with his new book, Mrs. Fletcher. Hello, Tom Parada. We're so glad to have you here tonight. This is your first visit to Anderson's Bookshop, we understand, and I don't know why it took so long for you to get here. No, I don't either. We're thrilled that you're here and to celebrate your new book, Mrs. Fletcher. So I wanted to sort of go back in history a little bit with you, and uh, I understand maybe your early published works were published in the Pariah, your high school <laughs> yes. literary journal from um, New Jersey. Is that correct? Yes. What that... do you recall about that, and how did that launch you on your writing career? Well, so what, what is interesting in retrospect was that my earliest high school work was very sci-fi and very influenced by the TV show Twilight Zone. Okay. Um, and that was just, the, you know, I did that and then I became a very different kind of writer in college. I started writing about uh, the small town where I came from and started to write coming of age stories. and. Um, that was my career until I wrote The Leftovers, which actually kind of harkened all the way back to those early stories. And I know Stephen King, uh, in a very generous review, said, oh, this is the greatest episode of Twilight Zone you never saw. And I sort of felt like, oh, I had really looped back to these early, early, early stories that, that I wrote and this influence that, of Rod Serling that um, you know, kind of blew my mind when I was a teenager. And so, um, was there any inkling prior to that? I mean, did you have a little, when you were a young child, did you do writing as well? Or, or did, I mean, when did you know you were going um, to be a writer? No, it, it really was a, a high school thing, which is young. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you met me on the first day of college and said, you know, what, what do you want to major in? I'd say, well, I'm majoring in English because I want to be a, a fiction writer. So, I think that's pretty early. I know people who have found that calling much later in life. Well, and now, I mean, all kinds of congratulations to you. It's, your book has been out one week, and it is just getting all kinds of buzz. So it's it's so nice to, to have you here with us. And, and it's great to hear that you started this um, idea of being a writer so young in your life. So how did you get the idea then about Mrs. Fletcher? What was the germ of this book? I was thinking about this sort of empty nest phase in uh, a parent's life, because my wife and I have just gone through it. And I don't usually write exactly about myself or what I'm going through, but a lot of people around me were going through it. I was going through it, and uh, it struck me that it was a second chance uh, at adulthood, in a way. You could sort of pick up, or th there's this feeling that you could just pick up and be who you were before you had kids. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. Fletcher is uh, the title character, Eve, is 46 years old. She's divorced. She's a single mom. And on the, in the first chapter, her son goes off to college, and she's home saying, what now? And she's lonely, and um, the book is about how she cures that loneliness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I was struck by the name Eve. I mean, did you do that on purpose, that here, here in the biblical terms, Eve is discovering the whole world, and this Eve is on the precipice of discovery? Different, a different kind of discovery about herself and her place in the world. Yeah, some, some writers are extremely subtle with their symbolism. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm extremely not. Um, because, uh, you know, Eve becomes, you know, sort of by accident, um, very interested in um, a certain kind of pornography that um, features middle-aged women, you know, sharing their sexual lives with, mm -hmm. with the Internet. And in this sense, you know, our Eve becomes, like the original Eve, um, a woman who wants to know. Um, and, and basically, the, this story is the story of, you know, the price of knowing and the uh, benefits of knowing. Well, you are sitting in Naperville, Illinois, which is sort of a smack dab in the middle of suburbia. And why are so many of your books, uh, why is this a rich area for you to, to mine for stories? Yeah, well, the, the first thing I should say is um, I never once sat down and said, I'm writing about suburbia. 
I always said I'm writing about this person. And it just turned out that this person happened to live in suburbia um, because that's where I've lived all my life. I spent a few years in, uh, um, in New York City when I was in my 20s. But otherwise, I've, I've been in suburbs and college towns, and that's sort of the scale of life that I know, and that my imagination just kind of pictures that. Naturally yeah, and, and, but I don't think it says anything about the suburbs. It says something more about me, which is that's where I live. Right. <laughs> well, and I did read earlier that, that when you started this book, I think it was mostly about yeah. Eve. But then it became this parallel story with Eve and her son. And how did you develop that idea? Well, you know, this often happens to me when I write, which is that uh, I get interested in the people around my main character. Mm -hmm. And the son, Brendan, is, uh, you know, hugely important. You know, he's going off to college. Eve uh, wants the best for him. She's worried about him. Um, but it, it struck me at a certain point when she drops him off that... Uh, they're on the same journey. She says it in, uh, you know, maybe one or two pages in. She just says, don't worry about me. I'm going to be fine. You know, we're both going to uh, have a great adventure this fall. And I sort of took her at her word, and, and I wanted to just follow the two of them when they're alone outside of this family unit that's defined their lives uh, up to now. Okay, now, without blushing too much, I wanted to ask you about um, your um, research into the world of pornography. Mm -hmm. That's kind of part <laughs> of this book. And um... yeah. Well, you know, l let me just begin by saying, um, you know, I, I'm 55 years old, so I grew up at a time when it was not, pornography was not easily available. So it's not a big part of my young life. I mean, I certainly saw it like everybody did, but it was, you know, it was somebody's older brother had a magazine hidden, you know, under the bed or whatever. Um, and then in the 80s, you remember there were these video stores and they'd have a, like the triple X section, you know, and, um, you, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I went there once and it was like, oh, that's so weird because all the people are here like going through this stuff and it's pretty explicit. But then, you know, suddenly, pornography is available on the internet and I remember you know I was already um, you know married and, and um, not on my own but but I just thought what a what an enormous difference between my experience of that and my kids experience of that like it's just ubiquitous now anybody who has any interest can find whatever they want um, and you know I remember who I was you know I had interest you know and uh, you know, once I started, well, I, I went to a, a talk in, at the Boston Book Festival and Nicholson Baker was there. He had written a very, um, you know, uh, uh, erotic, uh, intense book called House of Holes, which is about almost like just this fantasy sex world. And he was just saying, you know, I've, I've learned a lot about human nature from porn. And, um, you know, for this book, I was really interested in not an, I don't care about professional porn, I don't care about it as a business. I am very interested in this phenomenon in our culture now of people sharing their sex lives with the world, people feeling like, you know, the way, it's almost like, you know, if they have a great meal, they photograph that, <laughs> you know, but some other people feel like, right. you know, uh, here is, here's the, some part of my life that I want you to, to share in, you know, and that part of it is, seems brand new and, and pretty fascinating. And I think part of the comedy of this book is that Eve has been blissfully unaware of this whole part of our culture. Um, and if you look at the statistics, people say, you know, people use the internet like probably the number one thing. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about my statistics, but it's surprising mm -hmm. how much uh, porn gets watched on the internet. And it's also very interesting how many people don't watch any. You know. Um, so Eve just thinks about it as a parent until it sort of enters her life in this odd way. Um, she takes a class, right? Yeah, chapter. well, no, but actually what happens is she gets a text oh, that, yes. that yeah. uses a, a, a label <laughs> yes. that she's, she wants to investigate, mm -hmm. and that's where she suddenly mm -hmm. sees, like, there's this world where middle-aged women are seen as very attractive and alluring. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it's the world of the MILF. And mm -hmm. it's like, it gives her a sexual identity when she doesn't really have one and she tries it on and when she does she notices that the world looks a little different 
situations that seemed completely ordinary now have an erotic charge. You know, her fantasy life is, tur is turned up high. And, you know, she'll have a, a drink with a coworker who's a woman, and she's, she's straight as far as she knows, but suddenly it's like, well, there are a lot of MILFs who aren't, mm -hmm. you know, or she'll it be in a bar and chatting perfectly normally with the bartender and suddenly she's like, this, I could sleep with him mm -hmm. right now, you know, mm -hmm. something she wouldn't have thought about before. And I think, you know, part of the fun of the book, again, is sometimes she acts on these impulses, sometimes they're pure fantasy. Um, but that, that line between fantasy and reality um, is much blurrier for her once she starts, um, she gets into this sort of erotic reverie inspired by the porn. And in The Wizard of Oz, when she opens the door and everything's in color, suddenly <laughs> yes. it's like, oh, wow, I didn't know yeah. all this. Um, in fact, I did hear that it originally was going to be called The Mill. But yes. then can you tell the story about how that changed? <laughs> well, I, that's what I, I <laughs> sold it to my publisher with that title on it. And, um, but I wasn't really thinking about... Um, you know, it, I see it as a kind of ironic title. It's not, because that, that would sound like one kind of book, and it's not mm -hmm. that kind of book, but I like the, the shockingness of it mm -hmm. and the fact that you'd open it up and discover it's about a 46-year-old woman who runs a senior center and yeah, she's worried right. about her son. Um, but anyway, my publisher thought, A, there are going to be people who will be put off by that. There will also be people who don't know what it means. Um, it's a funny word in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and also, and this I think is the real crucial one, if you Googled it, um, you might find yourself um, navigating things you, you don't want to see, depending, or, right. or that you take, do want to see. It wouldn't take you necessarily to the, your book. Yes. So, <laughs> so um, we, you know, I, I, uh, I was stubborn about it because it had always had that title in my mind, and because it's a book about identity and how Eve borrows this identity and then it becomes her. And, and I thought that that was very interesting. And, and it tells us a lot about identity and sexual behavior. Not, none of us knows exactly how to behave sexually, right? It's a sort of a cultural construct that's changing all the time. My parents grew up in a sexual culture that was completely different from the sexual culture I grew up in. My kids are growing up in another one that's entirely different. And, um, you know, one way that it changes is, uh, that, you know, different identities are available to people. Like when I grew up, it was very difficult for people to say I'm gay, um, in the, at least in the working class world that I grew up in. But now it's, it's, you know, it's a lot easier, and so a lot more people can live that life. Um, and, but I think there are these other, like, weirder ones, whether it's Swinger or MILF or, um, you know, uh, the Internet's just full of them, and you can find people who want what you want much more easily than you used to and and so it's a little bit just about um the way that the available labels will influence our behavior and our identity well it's a very juicy and very smart book and you're so good at writing female characters and um so eve and amber as well i mean how do you do that how do you come at that um you know i was scared about it earlier in my career like my first couple books are very guy-based. Um, but I know when I wrote Election, I realized that I had to get it. I wanted to get at all the candidates who were running, and that happened to be two girls and one, one boy, and one of the girls was gay. And, and I, I thought, I just have to do this. I have to take the plunge. And what, what I realized was that um, all, I th and I, you know, when I talk to actors, they do this, they say the same thing. I need to find some point of connection between the character and, and me. And so, you know, Tammy in Election, um, I gave her a lot of my sort of teenage bad attitude. Um, Tracy, I gave a lot of my ambition. Um, uh, Eve, you know, I, I'm, I'm middle-aged too, you know, and I, 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 I'm, I it, was, it wasn't as hard as I thought to, you know, I look in the mirror sometimes and just go, hey, what happened to the guy I was, you know? <laughs> And, and it's much worse for women. You know, that's mm -hmm. all yes. I know in my head is it's, yes. you know, much harder for women. It's mm -hmm. not a big secret in the, in the culture. But um, it's always just that kind of empathetic identification between a writer and, and a character. I'm very, all, all, you know, even as a kid, I would read women's magazines. Um, I, I would listen. You know, I think 
women often feel like men just aren't listening, you know. But if you listen, women are talking about themselves all the time. <laughs> you know, it's not a big secret. A, a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, that said, I, I don't know. That's the skill of writing fiction, which is you're, you've got to make these characters believable. And it's, it means a lot to me when a woman tells me, oh. I recognized her because, um, you know, it, it's it's risky and men can be sometimes tone deaf about these things, or or it's very easy to, um, you know, project fantasies rather than get it, or a real human being, yeah. which is what you have. And yeah. it's, it's amazing. Okay, I was going to read you a quote that I found of yours. I hope this sounds familiar. <laughs> Writers need quiet daily moments to open the door to greater themes and feelings. Well, you have one heck of a busy schedule with everything you do. How do you find those moments? How do you carve out those moments to reflect those quiet moments? Um, well, you know, I have, I have a habit, and I think writers are very novelists in particular because you can't write a novel in fits and starts. You know, you have to kind of get, get a little bit today and a little bit tomorrow because otherwise it'll just wear you out. Um, so, I, you know, I, I get up in the morning and I... You know, have breakfast and I read the paper, and then at you know nine thirty or ten, I'm up in my office, and it's quiet up there, and I don't have a phone up there. I try not to check my email. I'm not saying I succeed at that all the time, but I, I do. You know, set aside a part of the day um, just for writing, and I, I try to keep that uh, sacred. Um, I have done my best not to have too much of a social media presence because the, the times that I've tried to do that and write, it often doesn't work. Like even if I just post something on Facebook, I keep going to check, like who saw it, who liked it, you know? And uh, it, whatever that mental quiet is that, um, that I need, um, it, it dissolves very quickly. Um, I remember reading Norman Mailer talk about this and he said, uh, don't talk on the phone before you write. And I, I learned this summer because I was writing this book under a very, um, hard deadline while the show The Leftovers was going on. So my mind was divided, but I, on the weekends, um, I was out in LA a lot of the time for the show, and I was living alone. And, um, and so I would just get up at like six in the morning and not read the paper and just start to write. And I was amazed at how much I could get done if, if I just went straight from, really literally from bed to the desk. Um, and I know there are writers who, who do that, and if I were a little more disciplined, I would try to do it more because it was um, remarkable, uh, you know, how, how much I could get done before lunch. Great. All right. I saw another quote of yours that said that at one point you really wanted to be a musician. Is that true? Can you sing? Can you play an instrument? Can you? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> are you just a fan of music? No, I, I, I have been playing guitar for about, with, with I had a big, Gap, but I've been playing since I was, you know, 13 or something. Um, I've only gotten competent in the past 10 years or so, and I play in, in a band now with some oh, really? middle-aged guys. Uh, <laughs> 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 if, we, if we call ourselves Food Baby, which is a kind, of, yes, which is not such a it's kind, yes, baby. I know. But we played a, we played a gig the other night, and I sang for the first time in public. Wow! Yeah. Congratulations! Thank you. Wow. I just broke out in this terrible sweat, but I did it. <laughs> And people were very, uh, very kind. <laughs> well, I did see the soundtrack sort of thing that you created for Mrs. Fletcher. And, of course, it had Mrs. Robinson by Simon mm -hmm. Garfunkel. And it had Stacy's mom yes. from uh, Files of Wayne. So I, that looked like fun. Did you just do that for kicks? Or uh, you know, they, they, they asked me to do it. And I thought, I thought it would be fun. And so what I did was just look at the book chapter by chapter and say, e e sometimes a song would be mentioned, like... Uh, Living on a Prayer is actually being sung by an a cappella group while Brendan is having a very uh, unsuccessful meeting with his academic advisor. So I talked about that. But other times it was more like uh, I, I mentioned uh, Fleetwood Mac's Landslide. And there's that feeling of, you know, I'm getting older too, that, that is so much on Eve's mind. And, um, you know, there's a Valentine's Day scene. And so I mentioned Bruce Springsteen's Valentine's Day, which is a great song that maybe even people who know Bruce may not know that one all that well, but um, so yeah, it was it was a lot of fun for me to to do that. And you know, having worked on the TV show The Leftovers, I became so conscious of how um, a musical soundtrack could transform dramatic action. 
Well, speaking of the leftovers then, um, so tell me how it's different writing for TV and how it's different writing for novels. Yeah, well, for me, it was like a, a completely other life because it was, I was writing in another city, um, you know, with a team of writers for a different medium. Uh, everything about it was, was different and that was what I found um, kind, of, kind of thrilling to, to be in the middle of a career and then be kind of a beginner in, in a certain way. Um, and it was, I was getting a little lonely in my, in my quiet room and so I, I really found it uh, to, be, to be very exciting. It was also, I'm not gonna romanticize it, it you know, it's a collaborative venture and, and like being in a band, you can discover that, um, you know, it's hard when you don't get your way and it, it can be tense uh, personally at times, but um, now that it's over, I look back on all that and just think, well, that, that was an amazing experience and, um, you know, this band made me better than I would have been on my own. Mm -hmm. um, so I did want to ask you too about The Leftovers. Your book did not have a clear ending. It was sort of left to, to interpretation, but the TV show, got an ending somehow. So how did you, when did that come in or how did that happen? Well, we, we moved past the show in, in season one. I mean, we, we got to the ending of the book and the finale of the first season. So we were in a sense just reinventing the story where the characters carried on, but we moved them to different places. And um, HBO, when they um, committed to the third season, um, we mutually decided this was going to be our, our last, and so, um, you know, we really wanted to end it right. Um, I will say, though, we did come up with a, uh, an ending, but it is uh, somewhat ambiguous. I mean, you can look at it in a couple of different ways, and people, people have, but we're really proud of, uh, of that ending. That's great. And HBO has, has optioned Mrs. Fletcher already, right? Yeah, and yeah. So how, where, where are you in the process of that and what, what will you expect to do for that? Well, that's an early, we're early in the process, so I'm gonna, when I get a little time to breathe, I'll try and um, write a pilot uh, for, for it. And, and I'm gonna try this time to, to be the, the showrunner, the person who's in charge of it. On The Leftovers, we had Damon Lindelof from Lost, who's just a genius. TV writer, and it was so great to work with him. I feel like I learned a lot from him, and um, I just want to give it a try, see if I can uh, make how, a show. How does it feel to see yourself, like the, you've had movies as well, The Candidate, mm -hmm. and you know, election, yeah, election, and, yeah. um, and TV, how does it feel to see your books on screen? It's been great, and I've had maybe an unusual um, string of luck with, well, with those. You're batting 500, aren't you? Yeah, I'm batting 1,000. 1,000, yeah. 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 <laughs> 500 is good too, but but, more I, than that. but I, I love both movies. I love Election and Little Children, and I think The Leftovers was terrific. So for me, it's always been just very exciting to see um, how how the work makes that transition and gets transformed in in the process. Um, you know, especially The Leftovers. I think went you know the the book is one thing, and the show is something else entirely. And, but I love it. I love what it became. And what are you working on right now? Um, uh, just, just the the pilot. I have an idea for a book that I'm just sort of more like I just let it stew for a while. I haven't really put any words on the page, but I, I have uh, enough to get started again when I have the right amount of quiet time. Good. All right. Well, thank you so much, and we're going to do a little round of fun little questions too. Here okay. At the end. Excellent. So, that was fun. All right. Good. Okay. Now I have this little lightning round. That lightning we do. round. The oh, lightning boy. round. So. If you are ready to go, All right. let's see. What were your favorite books when you were a child? Uh, Strange But True Football Stories and Lord of the Rings. <laughs> okay, well that's good. Um, what book in high school or college stays with you and has influenced you as a writer? Uh, the Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. Oh, excellent choice. Okay, so if you could have dinner with three other authors, alive or dead, who would you want at your dinner table? Uh, well, let me invite uh, Philip Roth, okay. uh, Willa Cather, and gotta have Shakespeare, right? Yeah, sure. Bring <laughs> Will. Have Will come and join you. Okay. Um, what was the last book that made you laugh or cry? 
last book that made me laugh. I just read Less by Andrew Sean Greer, okay. and it's a very funny book. Okay. And I heard him give a reading, and I laughed quite even, a bit. Even yes. more for me. Okay. Um, what book have you faked reading? Oh. <laughs> you're going to confess which one you're Proust. Proust, okay. <laughs> um, how many pages do you give a book before you put it down and say, okay, I've, I've done my best on that one, I'm not going further? I think if I get 100 pages in, I'll probably finish it. Okay, that's fair enough, I think. Um, what favorite book did you read with your children and enjoy together? You know, uh, we had a, a great time with the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Really? Yeah, I read them out loud to them, and they still remember it. That's great. Yeah. I think that's I am. That would not be something I would expect, but that's a great answer. Um, what are you reading now? Uh, I am in the middle of David Grossman's A Horse Walks Into a Bar. A Horse Walks Into a Bar. Yeah, okay. do you know him? He no. wrote To the End of the Land. He's an Israeli writer. Okay. And this is a, a it's a slim novel about uh, an Israeli stand-up comedian, and it's just like. <laughs> Yeah, it's just this. Oh it's my pretty, gosh! How it's did good. You, that's great. That, that, that's pretty funny. Um, what was the last book that you gave as a gift? Um, Jeff Dyer's *But Beautiful*, which is a um, book about jazz that I gave to one of the guys in my band. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. That's great. Okay, and what book are you an evangelical? I mean, what are you? Uh, what are you a champion of? What book would you? Oh, you that, have to read this book. that's a good one. Okay, um, put this book in their hands. Um, I'm always trying to get people to read Peter Goralnik, who's a writer about uh, blues and roots music. He wrote the Elvis biography and a biography of Sam Cooke. That's a masterpiece and a biography of so Sam Phillips. I am. No, I read a lot of uh, mm -hmm. music stuff. So um, his Elvis biography, I would tell you, you must read. Okay, great. All right. Thanks, Tom. And today we enjoyed our conversation with Tom Parada about Mrs. Fletcher. Thank you.